Yeah, we might need to lock this. Good evening, y'all. My name is Kenzie New Walker, and I work as the executive director of the West Virginia Mine Works Museum, a grassroots institution that educates and preserves a people's history of the Cold Wars. We're located in historic Mate One, and we've been around for nine years now. The museum's work entails a diverse public programming, including this Mine Wars Forum program. Our small team works daily to educate and preserve the stories of coal miners and their families' efforts to unionize the southern coal fields of West Virginia. We preserve and curate artifacts and exhibits, both digitally and in person. We provide lesson plans and a growing list of resources for teachers to get this history into their classrooms. And most recently, we have been building monuments in southern West Virginia with our Courage in the Hollers project. This evening, I'm excited to kick off episode two, season four of Mind Wars Forum. This year's forum has been made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program not necessarily represent those. I'm not sure either. He, he, I think he is Tonight, it is my honor to welcome Dr. John oh, Hinnon to the forum. Yeah, John grew up in Huntington, West Virginia, when organized labor was an important part of vital civil life in that industrial city. He began a PhD program in Appalachian history and modern US history at WVU while in his late thirties, mentored by Professor Ron Lewis, earning his doctorate in 1993. He later taught at Moorhead State University for 20 years, where he is now Professor Emeritus of History. He's the author of The Americanization of West Virginia, Creating a Modern Industrial State, and a union for Appalachian healthcare workers, the radical roots and hard fights of local 1199. Welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you guys are doing down there at the museum. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to just jump right in, and I thought I would ask you first, how did you get interested in U.S. labor history? Well, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I had uh, several jobs in my late teens and early 20s, uh, which included union membership. Uh, one job at a place called Acme Machinery in Huntington, uh, which was steel workers, and a couple of grocery store jobs back in the oh, mid-70s, I guess. Um, and I was a member for a while of the retail clerks and then a while of the meat cutters union. And they merged in 1978 and formed the United Food and Commercial Workers. So that had something to do with my early interest in, in the idea of unionization. Uh, and I think I probably got interested most directly in labor history when I led, read uh, Lon Savage's yeah. book, Thunder in the Mountains, which I believe came out in the mid to late 80s. I don't remember for certain. That sounds right. But that, that really sort of piqued my interest. And then I watched a documentary as an undergraduate at WVU, I'm pretty sure, uh, called Even the Heavens Weep, which I imagine you're, you're familiar with. Yeah. And that, that just kept getting me more interested. And the more jobs I had over the years before I went back to school, the more I became interested in the practical problems of the working class and convinced that the labor movement was the best way to help address those problems. So sure. then it just kind of took off after that. So in reading Lon Savage's book, which I think you're right, it was right around the mid eighties, maybe 80s. Was that the first time that you ever learned about Mate One? No, I'd heard about Mate One off and on for for years, but I didn't know, I really didn't know a whole lot about it. Uh, I also read a book at, at some point by Howard, Howard B. Lee's book on the, you know, the former attorney general called, what was it called? Bloodletting in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Somehow I came across that uh, and I started learning more and more about Mate One, but I had heard about Mate One for years before that. Yeah. 
were you taught like any labor history curriculum in public schools or is this it sounds like this is just something you kind of came about through personal experience in your yeah, own i don't i don't i don't recall i don't recall my public school education focusing much on labor history which of course you know is <laughs> yeah is an issue or always has been an issue yeah um, Okay. And Huntington, like, like I said, and you mentioned in your introduction, Huntington, when I was growing up, was a very vital union city. And I think just through osmosis, I picked up some of the culture of union, of the union movement and labor management. The unions sponsored baseball teams and picnics and subsidized all the kids' recreation programs. And I remember a neighbor that I had who worked for the steel workers and uh, this was in the early 19 or late 1960s, I guess I was just getting to be college age and he was off almost all summer. I said, Mr. Atkins, how'd you get such a long vacation? He says, I've got a steel workers contract. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, these people must have something to offer. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but being part of a union city, I think, influenced my even unconsciously my awareness of of how important they were to to building a healthy working class yeah totally so go to another union town and make one even though you you didn't learn about it in school um you became very familiar with it very familiar <laughs> yeah in the late 90s and so i wonder if you could take us back when when you and um one of your colleagues, Dr. Rebecca Bailey. Rebecca worked. Bailey. Actually, yeah. it was actually it was the late '80s. Um, yeah, yeah. When uh, uh, that was when I was just starting my graduate program, my PhD program at West Virginia. And like you said, I I was 37 when I started that. I'd been out knocking around doing other things for a long time. Then I went to Marshall and got my MA, uh, and then I decided to keep going in grad school. And like I said, I was familiar with the mine wars and with Matewan to some extent then, but it was when I really started studying it seriously that I got more immersed in it. And I worked, as you said, with Ron Lewis, who of course is, was the perfect mentor for somebody like me. And in my first year of graduate school there in 1988, the West Virginia Humanities Council was putting together an oral history program in Matewan focused on the Matewan massacre and more broadly on life and culture in and around Southern West Virginia. And Stuart McGee, who's, who's probably a name you're familiar with, who was a historian at Bluefield College in Virginia at that time. And uh, Barb Howe, who was a professor at WVU and a, a lady over in Huntington who worked for the Huntington galleries. I believe her name was Beth Hager, although I'm losing the thread of that. Anyway, they were sponsoring this oral history program and they needed a couple of graduate students to dive into it. And Becky and I volunteered right off and came down there and spent the summer in 1989 uh, conducting the first set of interviews. And then, of course, Becky came back at least one or two more summers after that to continue her research. I love that project. And I spent a lot of time with with the oral histories um, in undergrad. As no, a, I am I am very proud to have been a part of that from the from in the early days. I'm really proud of it. And uh, it was under the auspices of what was called the Matewan Development Center at that time. The director was Paul McAllister. And the lady that ran the office, I knew I would forget the name. I feel awful, but uh, was it Yvonne Dehart? It was Yvonne Dehart. Thank you. Yeah. How so? How did y'all select interviewees? Well, it was we were pretty lucky. I mean, I had done some oral histories before this, but the people at the Matewan Development Center had done a lot of the legwork before we came down there. They had lined up several. Oh, probably at least a couple dozen people who were willing to do the interviews. And uh, we just came down and started going to visit them and asking our questions, you know. So a lot of the groundwork that an oral historian normally has to do on their own, <clears throat> excuse me, 
had already been done. So we just were able to jump right in. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a lot of the interviews took place on like around kitchen tables and on porches. And so you went to them essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, it was actually fun. I noticed you had one question about my favorite ones. Can I talk about some of those now? Yes. That was my next question. Well, uh, you can probably tell me this. I don't know if Dixie Acord is still living or not. Uh, I know that when she lived a couple of years ago, she was 107. <laughs> I was surprised to hear she was still living. I hope she still is, but she was one of my favorites. Uh, Dixie Acord was one of them. Um, she, when the massacre happened, she was about nine or 10 years old and, uh, and <clears throat> had just gotten home from school uh, and stepped onto her grandmother's porch. And the way she told it was wonderful. She's a great storyteller. She said, and I put my foot down on the porch and a thousand shots were fired. <laughs> so that was Dixie. Another one was uh, Hiram Phillips, who ran a, he and his wife ran a feed store, I think, in town. Um, and he was, when he was four years old, he and his family were living in uh, uh, one of the tent communities, I uh, believe, on the Kentucky side of the river. Hmm. And he remembered he remembered hearing bullets whizzing over his head when he was sitting out on the hillside. And he didn't know what it was. He was four years old. And Hawthorne Burgraff, whose father was one of the defendants in the Matewan Massacre trial, Fred. And Hawthorne Burgraff was a... Uh, I believe he was a retired miner himself. I can't remember for sure, but he was also a preacher and he was probably the most amazing storyteller I'd ever heard. I don't know if you've heard, you've probably heard his, you've probably heard that interview. Yeah. I've read it. Have yeah. I? I've read it. He was, he was one, those were probably the th three of my real favorites and I'll never forget them. And Eddie Nanny and Rose Nanny were, were uh, Eddie and his mother Rose. They were a couple of my favorites. But it was fair. They were everybody was so kind to us. It just it just blew us both away. It was a wonderful, wonderful summer. Um, those so the oral histories are available uh, at the state archives. I think almost every single one is digitized, so you can read the transcripts for those that are watching. If you're interested, that's good to know. I had kind of lost track of of where they were being held, so. Yeah, and they're online, so they're easy to access. There, we can we can include a, a note in the um, in the comments. Another, just one other story about Hawthorne, if you don't mind. His he told me that the, the night the, the day that Sid Hatfield and Ed Chambers were leaving town to go over to Welch, that Hawthorne's father took him down to the train station to see him off. I think this is the way he told it. And he tried to give Sid Hatfield a pistol. And Sid supposedly told him, I'm not going to need it because that's all they want. You know, that's all they'll need to, to come after me. He said, the sheriff has assured me I'll be safe. <laughs> and that's the last they saw of Sid alive, you know. Yeah, I think he'd come back to make one three days later or four days later in a casket. Yeah, that's that's what Hawthorne said. He said the next time they saw him, he was in a he was a corpse. Yeah. Man. So <laughs> you've been you've been to Mate One since then. Has I've the town changed? Oh um yeah. I think the town is is in a little bit better shape now than it was when we were down there in nineteen eighty nine. Uh of course there was a there was a that was the year of the big Pittston strike too so there was a lot of action going on in town guys driving through in their camo and the big the, big, the, the famous uh, the famous scab that everybody knew and he'd drive through town in his truck and everybody would boo at him i, I can't remember his name um but as i recall that <clears throat> the town was uh it seems to me like it's it's kind of been rejuvenated a little bit since that era and that i think that's probably probably because of the work you guys are doing now i'll tell you one thing dixie acord told me though she did not like the way that mate wong was portrayed in the movie mm -hmm. she said all they showed was this one little dusty town it looked like 
you know, that no prosperous. She said, we had a prosperous, thriving little town here in 1920. And, uh, and they did. They had a lot of thriving businesses there at that time. And she told me anyway that the main drag was lined with beautiful, tall shade trees. But those all got wiped out in a couple of the floods, I think, in the 1970s. So she, she thought Matewan wasn't really treated very nicely in the, in the movie itself. Yeah, um, I guess the movie would have been fresh in everyone's minds at this time, especially. It was, yeah, it was. Sale, I think sales did a lot to to educate the, the broader public about Mate Wong, even though, of course, he took liberties with the, with the stories. It still did a great service by producing that movie. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about taking this history into the classroom. So one of our, our board members, Lou Martin, um, was a student of yours. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, what was it like teaching this history and what were you hoping that students would take away from it? Yeah, uh, yeah, Lou was, uh, geez, I'm trying to think when that was. That must have been about 1989 or 1990 when Lou was. We won't give away his age. <laughs> yeah. it, was his, it was his first class in West Virginia history, I think. And Lou's not what you would call a real talky guy now, but he was very quiet then. <laughs> I don't know that he opened his mouth the whole semester. He probably wouldn't want me to say that. But that was a great opportunity for me as part of my grad, a teaching assistantship. I got to teach the West Virginia history class. And by that time, of course, the movie had come out. Um, um, Lon Savage's book was out. Uh, I don't think Robert Shogun's book came out until later. And, of course, James Green's came out. James Green's book came out in about 2015, I think. Um, but that's one thing that Dr. Lewis and I both, of course, I was, I was Lewis's teaching assistant, and we were both very conscious of integrating the history of Matewan and the massacre, but also the, the broader history of labor and the coal and coal industry and, and the, the, the contract battles and the actual battles uh, and the, the role of the various coal operators in, in the, in the region. And it was, it was an experience for me. I learned, I definitely learned as much as my students did, uh, as that time went on. I also, I forgot to tell you, I had a job for a year at the West Virginia, what used to be called the department of history and culture, I think. And I had a job in the research archives there uh, before I started my graduate program. And I was able to look at a lot of the original documents from the Cold Wars and from the Matewan era. Uh, I saw, for instance, the pardon where Dan Chain, if you close Johnson, uh, was released from jail during the Paint Creek, Paint Creek and Cabin Creek strike. And I got to read the testimony of the various witnesses at the Senate committee hearings around Matewan, around Paint Creek and Matewan. And I was able to draw on a lot of that experience when I started teaching as well. Um, so I, I think it's time we talk a little bit about your first book, uh, which I, I mentioned earlier, but I'll say it again for folks tuning in. The Americanization of West Virginia, Creating a Modern Industrial State, 1916-1925. And this book, you know, covers some of the legislative steps that were taken uh, and directed against unions in the early mm -hmm. 20th century. And, you know, this was the period of the mine wars, really when the mine wars were, were at its height. Um, so mm -hmm. how did you find this topic and what made you decide it was worth writing a book about well, I, I have I have to drop back a little bit, if you don't mind. When you were at Marshall, I, I don't know that Frances Hensley was still teaching there when you were there. I think maybe she'd moved into a dean's role or something. But in 1984, when I started a, this may be more than you wanted to hear, <laughs> uh, 
I started a I started an MA program at Marshall in 1984, and I took a modern U.S. history class from Frances Hensley. And one of the things I'll never forget she talked about was how after the First World War, corporations and a, and a lot of educators and a lot of businesses, in, in order to try to create a culture that looked at capitalism as the only way to live, uh, began to come up with much more sophisticated ways to resist unionization and to create the create the idea in people's minds that unions were bad. She used to, she talked about that a lot in class, and I carried that with me uh, right into my studies. And that was the that was the seedbed of my dissertation, the Americanization of West Virginia, was Francis Hensley's class. And of course, this was the era of the Red Scare in in the larger country, anyway. <clears throat> and the officialdom of West Virginia, led by Governor Cornwell, uh, and in cahoots with coal operators, were absolutely determined to keep, particularly Southern West Virginia, to keep the Union out, the UMW out of Southern West Virginia. And they ran some very successful public relations propaganda campaigns uh, to get their message filtered through public school systems, through teachers' handbooks and stories or uh, teachers' publications and that kind of thing, to create the image that, that unions were unnecessary uh, in the country that had beat the Hun, you know, in the country that had defeated Germany, uh, there, was, there was no reason to have any kind of organization that would be critical of the way capitalism worked. Uh, and that was their their fear tactic, and that was combined with the more softer anti-union message of what was called the American Plan, uh, welfare capitalism, which your listeners will be familiar with. Um, and the John Cornwell papers, I recommend anybody who's interested in this in this period and how the anti-union movement got a foothold <laughs> in West Virginia and the country to, to look at the John Cornwell papers at the West Virginia Regional uh, History Collection because it's very eye-opening. The rhetoric was amazing about the Bolsheviks in Southern West Virginia and all this kind of stuff. John, do you think that history is repeating itself? <laughs> Well, there's that famous uh, famous saying by Mark Twain, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think it's actually repeating itself. I think it has just been a continuum. Uh, the old, if, if you think about it, the only period when the, the American people, when there was actually a thriving, growing, healthy uh, middle class, in the United States was in the aftermath of, Depre of the Depression and into World War II, which created the middle class. And that's when the labor movement was the strongest up until about the late 1960s. So the anti-unionism of the 19 teens and the 1920s, I don't think it ever went away. Uh, I think it, it, it just had to, uh, take a back seat for a while because the labor movement was so strong for that and the and labor law promoted the idea of unionization and collective bargaining after world war ii ended however you saw this this kickback this reaction by in part the, uh, the republican party and in part conservative democrats that unions had gotten too strong labor had gotten too strong so all the old methods that used to be used to badmouth the labor movement in the 1920s and the early 30s came back. And then, I guess I'm rambling too much. So I don't really think that history has repeated itself, but, but it's been kind of a continuum. And then when the labor movement basically crashed and burned, 
uh, in the Reagan era because of the structural changes in the economy and globalization and that sort of thing. Uh, ever since then, the labor movement's been trying to catch back up. And now we have no thriving middle class, really, when you think about it. Uh, those were the days when the middle class was strong and when the labor movement was strong, when people like me were able to go to college at a public university inexpensively. My tuition was $129 the first semester I was at Marshall University, full-time full student, which today would be about $900. So, and that was not all because, but a big part of that was because the gains that the folks struggled for back in the 20s and 30s and finally were able to realize their sons and daughters were, those were rolled back. And it was a conscious thing, too. Uh, it was partly globalization, partly Reaganomics, partly ideology. Uh, and the old battles, now it does seem that the old battles have to be repeated again. But thank goodness it looks like some of those old battles are beginning to be fought again through the Starbucks unions and folks like that. Yeah. I wonder, so we've talked about this propaganda that was happening. Could you speak a little bit about uh, some specific laws that were passed during this time? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm so, that Actually, that was part of your question. I, I kind of got astray from that. Okay. Yeah, the two that I the two that I wrote about and was really interested in, and there were others, and they were not limited to West Virginia. There were a lot of similar laws passed in other parts of the country, um, but they all had the same theme: um, don't let the working class get a say in how the country is run. That's what they were all about. One was called the uh, the Constabulary Bill which was the creation of the state police. Uh, and it was at the behest largely of, in, in, a, in a way it was Senate, uh, Governor Cornwell's, what you might call progressive reformist mentality that the way we're gonna take care of this chaos in the coal fields is to have a super police force, <laughs> uh, uh, which on the face of it was not a bad idea to have a state police force to maintain order in disorderly situations, you know, avoid violence. But uh, the UMW and other labor unions were convinced that the constabulary was going to become an arm of, you know, uh, 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 vicious capitalism, I guess you could say. And in a sense, that's what happened. Well, that was the constabulary bill. It was a big battle in the state legislature in 1919 and 1920. Uh, and the other one was that I studied was called the Red Flag Law, which was a real part of the Red Scare, the larger Red Scare in the country. And the Red Flag Law, West Virginia might, <clears throat> West Virginia might have been the first state that had this law. I'm not really certain anymore. But if Technically, if you displayed any kind of banner that was red or black, <laughs> you could be you could be prosecuted under the sedition law, the sedition laws in the country and in the state, uh, because it was seen as inciting riotous behavior uh, among among impressionable workers who don't know enough to make their own decisions. You know. Um, and another one was, which was associated with the mine wars more closely, uh, was the jury bill, uh, a law that was passed after the after the trial of the Maitwan defendants, and of course they were all acquitted in that trial. Uh, but the, some of the state legislatures said we cannot afford to have these guys getting off in these trials. We need to have a law that allows us to move the venue of the trial wherever we want to, to make sure that they'll be convicted. <laughs> that was the jury. And that was one of the, that was one of the things that kicked off the miners March. Of course, there was the flashpoint of the assassination of Hatfield and Chambers, but the part of the reaction was also because of this jury bill. When these, these folks in Southern West Virginia knew 
that if that actually became law, they would never get a fair trial again anywhere. And it did not become law. They managed to fight that off. So that was part of the legal battle. And then there was the battle that, as I studied in my first book, that, that came through the education system and the teachers' institutes that were sponsored by coal and railroad companies. And the teachers' institutes always had speakers that came in to teach about union busting. <laughs> that was part of the idea of being a good citizen and a good teacher was teach your students that they don't need a union to look out for them. Their, their company or their, their system will look out for them. Yeah. Now that's, you hear a lot of that talk even today. How many yeah. times have you heard somebody say, well, unions might've been necessary at one time, but they're not anymore because we have enlightened companies now. I'm yeah. sure you've heard that one before. Absolutely. Um, and I remember the article that came out a couple of years ago, Amazon was looking at creating factory towns. And was like, well, let us tell you why this is a bad idea. <laughs> you know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, losing you, sorry. It's okay. I was just, I was making a reference to an, an article that came out with Amazon uh, and they were exploring factory towns. Did you catch that? Something about Amazon and factory towns. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to move us to our next question because we've got, okay. <laughs> we've got a few minutes left and I want to encourage folks who are watching with us tonight. If you have a question that you would like to ask, drop it in the comments and we will get to it. Um, John well, one other thing, one other thing that became sort of a science in this era when you're talking about, you know, repeating itself was the, was the sophistication of the union busting industry. Uh, which is now called management consulting. Uh, it became very sophisticated over time as using the message that workers are part of a family. Uh, workers don't need outside agencies coming in here and telling them how to think. Now that's really part of the anti-union mantra today that you hear in every un in every union campaign, you'll hear where the management consultants or trying to convince Amazon workers, for instance, mm -hmm. hey, we're all part of a family here. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about your time uh, during the 2011 protest march. I, I've met a lot of people who were a part of that march. What was that like for you? That was, uh, that was one of those highlights of my life to this point, I think. And of course, Lou was Lou was involved in it, and Chuck Chuck Keeney uh, was was a big part of that, uh, and that was a very exciting time. And it was probably, it, it, in a way, it was probably the most dangerous situation I've been in. Although it was very well put together and very well organized, but there were some pretty serious threats that came down through the grapevine about what might happen to these marchers, you know, and nothing really came of it. Thank goodness. But it was, a, it was a very inspiring time, particularly when we, we finally marched up. There was, there was one, one part of that we were marching up towards the mountain and there was a restricted area that we weren't supposed to go on because that was owned by, I forget the company's name. Uh, but about 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 of us just broke off and essentially trespassed onto Blair Mountain. Uh, now, that was a thrill. <laughs> yeah. That was very exciting to see that many people. And to see so many, it was such a, a, a diverse group, particularly uh, racially and culturally and age-wise. There were people all the way from 14 or 15 to 75 or 80 participating in at least part part of the march and uh, it was very exciting yeah i i hear those sentiments uh those same sentiments from a lot of people who were were involved i also wanted to ask you what was it like coming back to marmette 11 years later so you were at our courage in the hollers uh, to see the courage in the hollers oh yeah that was really that was a treat it was a treat 
um, every time when I would leave, I live in Southwest Virginia now, and whenever I drive over to visit folks in Huntington or in Moorhead, I go right by there. And I always think, you know, when I go by Marmette, I would look and see if I could find the place we stayed and everything. And it, it was nice to be able to, I didn't really have any reason to go to Marmette again, but when you guys had this, the dedication last summer, uh, it was a thrill to, to, to come back and see Marmette again. And um, some of the buildings had different purposes, but they were still there. The big building we stayed in and sort of crashed in when we were in Marmette is now a big uh, consignment shop, a big antique shop or something. You know? And it was, it was great to see. And it was great to see this the statuary and it was great to see Terry and Wilma. You know, it was just it was just a real it was a real treat to come back through there last summer. That's awesome. You can you can actually see the monument from the interstate. Uh if you look carefully, don't look too yeah, hard. You gotta, you gotta, yeah, I could glance over. It's really exciting. We had so much fun working on it with the folks in Marmette and in Clothier. So for folks watching, uh -huh. go to our website, uh, wdmindwars.org slash courage. It will give you driving directions. It'll tell you all about the project. Check it out because it's gonna it's gonna drive a lot of the museum's work for the coming years. Yeah, it's well it's well worth taking a side trip to Marmette and to Clothier, I'm sure too. I haven't been to that one, but I've been to the yeah. one at Marmette. They're both really, really special. Um, so I wanted to, my last questions are about your latest book, uh, Union for Appalachian Healthcare Workers. So what led you to start researching SEIU Local 1199? Well, this, when I was, um, it, again, when I was at Marshall in that master's program in 1984, I was involved with a lot of, we had a very active anti-war and anti-Central American intervention and environmental group. It was called Marshall Action for Peaceful Solutions. I give it a plug every chance I can. Um, and we did a lot of work with 1199 uh, on labor solidarity uh, protests or labor solidarity demonstrations. And they were involved in a lot of veterans' rights campaigns in and around Huntington that we worked together uh, and I got to know some of the people who worked with 1199 there and got interested in the work they did. Now, before that, way back in the late sixties, I was an undergraduate student at Marshall uh, when the students for democratic society were organizing on the campus. Uh, and that the first, the first, the uh, first, scholarly article I published actually was about the Students for Democratic Society campaign at Marshall. And one of the leaders was a guy named Tom Woodruff. And I later interviewed Tom Woodruff for the SDS project. That was in the 1980s when I was doing research on it. And he was also, oh, sorry, I gotta be quieter. There's time. He was also part of the Appalachian Movement Press and he was also one of the first organizers for Local 1199. So this stuff sort of just all came together. And after I had gone through my graduate school program at WVU, can you hear me at all? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, they're praying, so. Um, we can take uh, a moment if you want to. And, it may take more than a moment. <laughs> and I want, and I even worked for 1199 for a very brief period of time, not very long, but I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something to, to make sure the stories of these people in 1199 weren't forgotten. They were organizing. The period I was interested in was 1970 to 1989. Organizing at Cabell Huntington, organizing at Fairmont General, mostly women, most all, all low wage workers, 
1199 had a fascinating history before it came to Appalachia. It was an interracial union that organized poor hospital workers from, in New York City, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, African Americans, and mostly women. And then they started organizing in, in Southern Appalachia in the early 1970s. And that's when Woodruff got involved with them. And I just became fascinated by that compelling story of how this radical union from New York City got a foothold in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, working with Southern, Southern whites, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a fascinating story to me. And a guy named Phil Carter at Marshall, whom you may know, he's the, he's the director, the, he was the director of the social work program. He told me once, he said, well, you know, that really should be your next book. You should do your book on 1199. I said, well, of course I should. So I did. And um, it, it was a 20 year project. Now, I didn't work on it for 20 years, but I worked on it during a 20 year period and finally finished it last year. Yeah, I'm that's, pretty proud of it. <laughs> that's awesome. For folks watching, we do carry um, that book in the museum. We'll drop a link if y'all want to pick it up. Every purchase supports the preservation of mine wars and working class history. Uh, and that's WVU Press does a lot of really good stuff. They're, they're, they're a great service to, to West Virginia and the region. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud that they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. Good people. Um, what could organizers, modern day organizers, learn from this history? Oh, man, that's a big question. One, they could learn modern day organizers. And I think modern day organizers have learned not to use it when you're when you're putting when you're trying to when you're trying to mobilize workers and then organize workers, make sure they do as much of the work as they possibly can. Don't don't fall into sort of an old organizing model of a top down bureaucratic approach. Uh, now, that can be successful, and it has been successful for a lot of unions. But if you want to have a, a really democratically run union that people are loyal to and feel like it's really part of their life and culture, they have to be a part of the decision-making process. Um, it's like in, in 1199, I always had that reputation of being, we're a democratic union, we're a democratic union. We can't expect people to work hard for the union if they're not going to have something to say about what the union's doing. And it's not that they didn't sometimes have clashes with the membership, but that was always sort of their their guiding star. And then that, that's why I, one other thing, that's why I stopped my study at the time of the merger with the service employees, the international union, because I have great admiration for the service employees, but it was a much bigger thing, a much bigger movement than 1199 was. And 1199 and other smaller unions ended up feeling like they needed to have a more powerful ally. Uh, but otherwise, the healthcare industry was getting so big and powerful. 1199 might have been smothered. Who knows? So they made the merger with the service employees, and it has worked out pretty well. <laughs> Good. Well, um, John, I want to say thank you so much. This I, I'm leaving this conversation uh, definitely richer in knowledge and also just really inspired by you and your work. Um, thank you. you know, like I said, I, I remember pouring over this May 1 oral histories and, and seeing your name a lot. So this you doing this conversation with me in this program you talk to me on a personal level and i'm sure our members appreciate it as well um if there's any questions i'll do a last call uh, if there's any questions for john I've been talking too much john do you do you have anything else that you want to add um just keep doing what you're doing i think i think you folks at the mine wars museum and i'm glad to hear you're about ready to bring on some new staff you said Yep. And folks out there, um, I have great respect 
for the discipline of history and I have great respect for academic history and I have great respect for teaching the, the history that's taught in the public schools. Uh, but make sure that you get some of this in the public schools <laughs> if you can too. you know, there's just, it just needs it. People need to know what built. We're always talking about the middle class, the middle class, the middle class. You know? Unions made the middle class. Uh, there's no way around that. Uh, and if we're ever going to have a, a vital middle class again, the labor movement's going to have to be a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you again, John. I want to say thanks to our listeners who stuck with us tonight. Those, uh, we appreciate y'all. We appreciate your company. I want to say thanks again to the West Virginia Humanities Council for supporting the programming. I want to say thanks to my colleague, Kirsten, who you cannot see tonight, but has uh, been really involved in promoting and supporting tonight's episode. Um, and as always, I want to say thanks to the museum members and donors who make every single inch of the museum's work possible. Uh, you allow us to continue doing this work. And so uh, speaking of membership, we, we have a special treat for our members who might be watching, uh, or for those of you who are watching and aren't members just yet, um, we've got a gift for you. So uh, we've got 20% off and early access to our newest and coziest item in our gift shop, uh, and that's these new sweatshirts. Um, as you can see, it features a new variation of our logo, and it is black, uh, with white print and with these colors, I think they're going to go with about anything you've got hanging in your closet. Um, and the best part, they are made in the USA and screen printed by union workers at Mountain Mindful right here in West Virginia. So uh, these workers are just one county over in Wayne County. Um, and these aren't released to the public yet. Uh, so this promotional deal is limited and ends in one week. So members get an opportunity to grab theirs first and get a discount. And of course, help us teach this history. Um, you're going to be hearing from us over the next few weeks because we're going to have forum episodes every week until mid-February. Um, so keep an eye out. Uh, you can hear from us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're on TikTok and YouTube. Um, so there's plenty of ways to stay in touch with us and follow us. Um, as a reminder, we want to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. Uh, from the folks watching right now, we've dropped a three minute survey. That's all we're asking for, three minutes of your time. Um, so we can hear from you on how we did, who you wanna hear from next. Uh, your feedback really helps us make this better. Um, you know. We, we want to we want to make it better um so with that being said uh thank you again john thanks to everyone we have my to pleasure see y'all next everybody week. if you haven't been down to the museum make it make a trip down in the spring or summer you won't regret it it's a great experience yeah come see us good night everybody